I bought a used Malkonig EK43 at auction for 500 euros not long ago. They look indestructible, but do they really hold up? Can I restore it for a modest sum? Does it make sense to buy used industrial kit for home or commercial use? How would you evaluate a piece of gear like this? Well, here's how I do it. I'm going to tear it down to its very bits and inspect and test everything. The grind chamber and burrs, the adjustment mechanism, the electrical components, and the motor and bearings. My goal will be to diagnose and correct all of its faults and make it fit for commercial use as a shop grinder once again without spending too much. This will give you a good idea of the sorts of tests and measurements you should perform or arrange to have performed if you're in the market for a used commercial machine or simply want to repair, set up, or maintain one yourself. Fair warning to EK enthusiasts, I encountered three unpleasant surprises inside here. The first was clearly a previous owner's doing. The second, and worst, is a manufacturing felony which might point to a dirty little secret about the EK43 line. I could be wrong about that, but wait till you see it. And item three is a toss-up, maybe an owner's doing, possibly the company's. So let me be clear. The following program contains scenes that some fanboys might find offensive. Of course, I know the rest of you can't wait. This video covers the teardown, inspection, testing, fault diagnosis, and to-do list, after which I'll post a follow-up where I'll repair or replace what's broken, reassemble it, lubricate it, and then measure, adjust, align, and tweak everything for peak performance. No pun. And once I've got it fully restored, I'll taste test it with espresso, mocha pot, and V60 coffee and see if it really lives up to the hype. So get comfortable. We've got a lot to cover. And this is only the half of it. Oh my God. It's like a miracle. Looking over the exterior, you can see she's a bit shopworn. Lots of nicks and scratches. The original gigantic hopper was badly scraped up, so I cut it down to size and wet sanded it to get this frosted effect. This hides the scratches pretty well, but I won't sand them out completely. I don't want it to look new, just decent. If I made it look new, it would seem out of place. I think it's proportionally too small for the machine, which I find irritating, but it holds 150 grams of coffee comfortably, so I really don't want it any bigger. The grinder is already too tall. There is a gasket missing here, so that will be our first item on the parts list. Looking at the feet, I see some evidence that it stood in a wet environment. Still, it runs, and it doesn't vibrate or make any discouraging noises, so this might well have been a sound purchase. We'll see. When I remove the chute, I find nothing scary. The gasket here needs replacing, as does the anti-static strip, which is largely absent. The spring, the rubber stop, and the action are all fine. You'll find threaded inserts like these fitted in all of the cast body parts, something I always like to see. Next, I'll open the front cover and inspect the adjustment mechanism. I loathe slotted fasteners because they invite people to use coins and table knives instead of proper tools. This too is slotted, but it's an adjustment screw, not a fastener, so I have no objection. But these mangled screws here, I'll replace with proper ones. Naturally, they've been over-tightened, so the screwdriver cams out. A drop of light cleaning oil and a 10-minute wait followed by a few wax with a plastic, or in this case, hide mallet. And we're good to go. Whenever you take this cover off for cleaning, you can leave the adjustment cap in place and so maintain your zero orientation. But I have to inspect everything inside here, so I'll remove it. I don't like to boast, but this unit goes to 11. Actually, I find this position label really cheap looking, so I'm going to replace it with a better one. There are several places in the EK where inadequate lubrication can lead to damage. One of its drawbacks is that it requires periodic manual lubrication. In the next video, I'll talk about the correct type and proper use of lubricants.
In here we have a fretted adjustment spindle and a threaded bore, both of which are fine, a sealed ball bearing and two bearing seats. The design has evolved somewhat so yours might look a bit different. In the bore there's a ring made of felt which serves as a seal against coffee grit migrating into the adjustment mechanism. This is a very old, economical and effective design and I like seeing it here. There's another one of these at the other end of the grind chamber which I'll show you in a bit. I'll replace both as a matter of course. They're quite inexpensive and I consider them consumable. The ball bearing shows no sign of surface corrosion, leaking lubricant, discoloration from heat, or either loose or rough action, so it passes inspection handily. This one never sees the kind of stress that the two motor shaft bearings have to endure, so I would not replace it if I were planning to keep this machine and use it exclusively at home. However, I might sell it to a cafe, so to prepare it for a return to service as a shop grinder, I'll replace the bearing and both bearing seats along with the felt bushing. Just FYI, if I were planning to keep it for home use, I might do something like this. I see some corrosion on the inside of the seat here, but nothing really touches that surface, so I'll just clean it with a fine abrasive. The outside surface bears against the threaded adjustment spindle, and the inner shoulder bears against the ball bearing's outer race, and both are in perfect condition. This seat bears against the rotary burr carrier and establishes its location along the motor shaft. I see some pitting and scoring, probably due to inadequate lubrication or the wrong lubricant. I'll dress the surface with some 1000 grit sandpaper and oil to remove the worst of it. There's no need to take it any farther than this. In home use, with proper lubrication, this assembly will perform well and last for years with minimal maintenance. I also see a little pitting on the spacer bushing or sleeve that sits between the main pressure spring and the auger end of the rotary carrier. This is how the parts line up. Surfaces that bear against each other or rotate around another need to be lubricated periodically. As I said, I'll cover lubrication in detail in the next video where I'll be putting all of this back together. This is the older steel rotary carrier with a wire auger, which means the machine was built before April of 2018. I'll replace the spacer bushing along with the main pressure spring, which I consider another consumable item. I think it's reasonable to replace the shear plate too, since it's a bit scored. Let's have a look at the burrs. Nothing remarkable at first glance. They both feel quite sharp, which is surprising for ones as old as I assume these to be. Oh my, what have we got here? This is the rotary burr, and the back has been ground in one area, enough to remove the shoulder. So the first thing I'll do is measure it. And the thickness is inconsistent, ranging from 8.80 millimeters down to 8.76 millimeters. The stationary burr has not been ground on the back and shows 8.8 .8 millimeters all around. Looking closely, I sense that the distance between the tops of the flats and the bottoms of the troughs is a bit less than stock. These are both stamped coffee, but they remind me of the Turkish ones, especially when I place them together like this. The gaps look smaller than I recall. This could be a placebo effect. I believe there's an issue, so I start seeing an issue. But yeah, I kind of sense that there ought to be a greater distance between the tops of the flats and the bottoms of the groove. However, I doubt that this is a disaster. I think we can still make good coffee. First, I'm going to dress the flat cutting surfaces so that I can see more clearly what condition they're in. I'm using an 8,000 grit water stone just to hone them, knock any little high spots down, and see if the plane is flat or wavy. I've got a lapping plate that will true the stone in a minute or so. You can see that this one is slightly hollow in the middle from use, as you would expect. And within a minute or two, it's dead level. The plate is flat to within 3 microns. I use the little triangular logo for orientation and rotate the workpiece 90 degrees after a specific number of strokes. This will make the camera shake, so I'll cut that. This takes only about 5 minutes, and here's the result. Nicely polished with no hollow areas. The flats form a nice level plane, which means the burrs are probably still good. 
I ignore any little low spots or scratches because they have zero impact on performance. If you doubt me, ask yourself what effect these six honkin' big screw holes might have on grind quality. A few nicks and scratches are of no consequence. The leading edges were sharp to begin with, and now they feel razor sharp. This is very hard steel 64 to 66 Rockwell C, which is around the upper limit for steel tools, so these will hold a keen edge for a while. The rotary burr carrier looks all right, but the deck measures 6.98 millimeters at its thinnest location and 7.08 millimeters at its thickest for a side to side difference of a tenth of a millimeter, which is too much. I'm wondering, does that mean the burr mounting surface isn't perpendicular to the motor shaft? We'll have to see. Perhaps this is what prompted someone to try grinding the burr. For now, I'll orient the weird burr to this carrier so that the thinnest and thickest areas of both parts are opposite each other and temporarily shim it the rest of the way for a consistent thickness. Centering the burr is easy with three plastic shims thick enough to fit snugly but not too tightly set 120 degrees apart. The ones I'm using are four tenths of a millimeter thick. I'm working off the carrier, although the best way is to work off the motor shaft, but this is quick and easy and it usually puts you in the ballpark with very little fuss. With the burr shimmed and mounted, I have a consistent combined thickness of 15.85 millimeters all around. I hope this will be a sensible starting point for further alignment later when I do some fine tuning after reassembling the machine. Taking a few minutes now to square things up ahead of time should simplify matters. Of course, it's possible that the burr alteration was done in response to some bizarre misalignment or damage to the carrier, so there is a chance that squaring up these parts now might leave them wildly out of whack with everything put back together. I don't yet know that the burr mounting surface here actually is perpendicular to the center line of the motor shaft but I can start over if necessary. Aligning burrs isn't a big job. Now let's inspect the motor and bearings before testing the electrical components. This is a 230 volt single phase AC induction motor and it is wonderfully old school. First, I'll pop off the grind chamber housing. I like to note the orientation to make it easier to line up the threaded rods later. These acorn nuts are 7 millimeters, and you can comfortably use a quarter inch drive ratchet. The lock washers are brittle and broken. The nuts don't feel over tightened, so I'm thinking the washers are just cheap and old. We might need to provide some encouragement here and there. I like to use this because it has a copper face for striking steel and cast iron and a hide face for anything softer. You can always use plastic, but I prefer hide because it's safer on painted surfaces. Not that I'd worry about the paint here, but in general I do. A few smacks, a little twisting action, and the housing comes away. The casting is okay, I guess. There appears to be a small gas pore not far from a larger shrinkage cavity, and a couple of tiny pores hardly worth mentioning. The surface here might have come away from the mold slightly, but no harm done, that's just cosmetic. I'm not too disappointed. It's a complicated piece. It's not beautiful, but there aren't any defects that would affect performance or durability. Still, it's not going to win any awards. Here's the motor shaft. We can see the bearings, impeller, and laminated squirrel cage rotor. The shaft looks fine. No scoring or discoloration from heat. Just a little polishing here and there. I won't bother checking run out with these old bearings, which I'm pretty sure I'll be replacing. I'll check the shaft and numerous other points to verify that the components are concentric, parallel, or perpendicular as required, but I'll do that after I get everything back up to spec. The front bearing seat looks fine, no visible scars. Some lubricant has trapped a few large coffee particles, but there's very little. In the narrow part of the bore, you'll find the other felt ring, which seals around the spacer bushing, preventing coffee grit from migrating. I'm impressed. The felt bushings work nicely. There's also a spring washer that pushes the rotor toward the rear bearing seat. 
I'll replace it and the felt bushings retaining ring as a matter of course. I consider them consumable too. The rotor bearings are very important. Excessive wear here can translate into damage, so they need to be examined carefully. This isn't the impeller's normal position, by the way. I've moved it and taped up the centrifugal switch actuator so I can see the bearings better. There's no leaking lubricant, no discoloration from heat, no noise, and no evidence of creep in the seats or on the shaft. But the rear one feels a bit loose. Maybe you can see this. It moves too much. And the action feels slightly crunchy, as it does with the front one too, so they're both out. When this motor starts, it develops a respectable amount of torque. The rotor is heavy, as are the motor shaft, the steel carrier, and the burr, so there's a lot of inertia there. The starting load is substantial and puts a sudden, sharp stress on the rotor bearings. I'm going to upgrade these a bit when I replace them, and I'll explain all of that next time. Startup also stresses the stator windings, which I'll check now. I'll knock off the back using a cushioned handle and a mallet. I want to avoid striking either the centrifugal switch or the center area because there's only a very thin cover plate over the bearing. So I locate the ratchet handle off center away from the switch, give it a smack, and that's all it takes. This part of the switch is wired, so do this in such a way that the cover won't fall farther than the wire's length. The laminated core looks great. The air gap surfaces look pristine, except for the random globs of resin. To prevent contact between the wire conductors and the core, we have slot liners and U-shaped wedges that look all right, but the job doesn't look finished to me. The winding insulation is underwhelming. Remember what I said about starting torque and inertia hammering the bearings? That torque can move these wires ever so slightly during startup too. That means vibration, which means friction, and gradual degradation of the primary insulation, which is the wire's factory coating. This is called enameled wire or magnet wire, and each strand is coated with a thin veneer of insulating resin, without which everything would short to everything else. The original wire is not sufficient to make the stator a reliable, long-lasting part. In a high-quality motor, we expect to find additional insulation to unify and strengthen the windings. It's common to use a synthetic resin for secondary insulation. The stator is often dipped, then cured in an oven. There are several techniques, but they all serve to insulate and immobilize the wires. It appears that some resin was applied manually and stingily. You can look at the laces to judge the quality and consistency of the application. In this case, it varies. I hope this discolored area is a buildup of dust, not damage resulting from inadequate insulation, but I'll look again after some cleaning. And yeah, with the dust cleaned up, the surface imperfections remain, suggesting that we might have a little heat damage or dielectric breakdown, which is the process by which an electric current gradually degrades the insulating medium, eventually making it slightly conductive and inviting a short. Looking at the connection end, secondary insulation is barely in evidence. The area where the windings enter the slots looks untreated and the lacing looks dry. There are significant voids, as if it never received any real impregnation treatment. You might see this on cheap motors, but I think when you spend 2,500 to 3,500 euros on a German-made heavy-duty shop grinder, you're entitled to exemplary insulation. I'm sorry, but this is not good enough. I am disappointed in the king of grinders. I'll have a go with some insulating lacquer. I can't get resin into the slots, but I can protect the crown areas. There's a 3M product I like for that, which I'll cover next time. This is not ideal, but it will be an improvement. In fact, it might end up better than new. So, I hear you wondering, how does this thing work anyway? It's pretty simple in principle. Alternating current passes through the windings, activating the core as an electromagnet with a rotating magnetic field, which drives the rotor by inducing a current in it. If you've ever used one magnet to push another one without them touching, you already have a feel for what I'm talking about. Now, a three-phase current supply will create a rotating magnetic field naturally without any intervention. But because this is a single phase motor, the current simply oscillates, in my case at 50 Hz or at 60 Hz in North America. So we need a way to get the rotor to rotate. 
I'm sure you've seen examples where linear oscillating input can support rotation once you get things going. For that to happen, this type of motor uses two separate windings, one for starting and one for running. I'll show you. Here you can see the start winding, which uses smaller gauge wire, and beside it, the main winding. For the rotor to get moving, it just needs a nudge in the right direction, which the start winding supplies with a magnetic field that's slightly out of phase with the main winding. Clever, isn't it? But the start winding is not designed to be powered for very long. The narrow gauge wire would soon overheat due to its high resistance. Remember that electrical resistance goes up as wire thickness goes down, so we need a way to switch off the starting power once the motor is up and running. And that, too, is clever. A capacitor charges the start winding, and we'll look at that in a moment, while a centrifugal switch, which I'll show you now, opens the circuit when the rotor comes up to speed, shutting off current to the start winding. It's a pretty ancient design, but it really works. There are other approaches, such as using a start relay, but this is tried and true. The actuator is here on the rotor. The circuit contacts are on the rear cover. The actuator is operated mechanically by spring-loaded weights that automatically move this contactor to open the circuit once the motor reaches a certain speed. The circuit remains closed by default so that power will be supplied to the start winding immediately when you press the on button. It's also important never to lubricate any part of the centrifugal switch because lubricants can attract dust and dirt and can oxidize and degrade, all of which are routes to failure. And here's another disappointment. The motor housing's interior surface shows minor damage from moisture. I'm going to guess that a previous owner might have ignored the recommended duty cycle of 40 minutes on and 30 minutes off. Home users needn't worry about any of this, but you pros listen up. When a motor gets too hot, you will get condensation inside as it cools. If you push it, you might think you're getting away with it because the machine will handle the abuse gracefully. There won't be any obvious overheating or struggling or vibration or odd noises. It will behave normally and you'll think that the manufacturer is overcautious. But if you run it longer than you should or otherwise let it get hotter than it's designed to be, then let it cool and repeat that routine several times a day for a few years, this is what you're likely to find. Moisture condensation inside the motor housing is one of the issues that the duty cycle is addressing. Just because the machine shows no signs of distress, that does not mean that you aren't pushing it too hard. Looking at the motor and drive assembly overall, I see light wear but no mechanical damage. So this is a great time to service it before wear has a chance to evolve into harm. Mechanically speaking, I can make this machine as good as new with a modest outlay in parts. There are some sophisticated and expensive devices for testing motors. Baker analyzers, core loss testers, and such, none of which I have handy. But that's fine. This motor runs as expected. Nothing's open, nothing's short, and nothing's weird. So I only need to check the two capacitors. They don't wear out exactly, but they age, so it's good to have a look even if the machine is working normally. I'll remove the base with a 5mm Allen wrench, and this ground wire with a number 2 posi. These capacitors are both high quality parts. Nevertheless, close visual inspection is crucial. Examine them very carefully for any bulging, swelling, or leakage. Under the wrong circumstances, caps can literally explode. I mean, not like a hand grenade, usually. But they can burst, they can overheat, they can catch fire. So if you have even the merest reason to question the soundness of your capacitors, replace them. These both look new, and they might be. There's a lock washer missing from the board, so I know someone's been in here before me. Let's check the run cap. It's important to disconnect it from the circuit for testing. I'm looking for 25 microfarad, plus or minus 10%. And sure enough, it's right on target. The start cap is smaller, but it's rated for 180 microfarad, which means it could harm you if you mishandle it. The 4,000 ohm bleed resistor is there for safety, but never trust one. 
they can fail open with no outward sign, leaving the cap charged. So use a properly insulated screwdriver to short the cap before you start fooling around. Again, remove it from the circuit before you test. So, the capacitance is, uh, 246 microfarad? That's out of spec by a lot more than 10%, more like 30%. And most oddly, it failed up, which is, you know, impossible. But I think I know what this is. The multimeter defaults to using automatic range selection. It's possible that the cap is below spec and the multimeter silently switched itself to nanofarads, 246 of which would be a pretty lame reading. It just looked like a high value due to the change of scale. You have to watch those automatic settings. I think that's a really simple and good explanation, so I'm sorry to find that it's wrong. The meter tells me it's reading micro, not nano. So let me select microfarads manually. That way we can be sure. And, well, that's a puzzler. 180 rated with around 245 showing. So what the heck is going on? I have to think that the bleed resistor is confusing my multimeter. I'll wager that if I were to test the resistor and cap separately, they would both read exactly right. I'd be very surprised if there's anything actually wrong with either of them. I'm not going to test that hypothesis because the resistor leads are tied and soldered, and that means I would have to snip them, which will leave them short, so I'd have to splice in a couple of lengths of wire, and it all seems like cracking a nut with a sledgehammer. So, back it goes. Out of sight, out of mind. I'm sure there's no way I'm ever going to regret this decision. So that's the Grand Tour. Mechanical wear is quite reasonable, so with a few new parts, I expect it to be as good as new. The stator windings don't impress me, but I will do some preventative maintenance that I hope will leave the motor in slightly better shape than when it was new. I've posted the parts list in the video description if anyone's curious. The subtotal currently stands at around 175 euros. If that really is all it takes to restore this beast and make it suitable for commercial duty once again, then adding the original 500 euro auction price, I'll see a total outlay of 675 euros for a reconditioned machine, which to me is a solid deal. However, if I have to replace the burrs and or the rotary carrier, I'll be considerably less enthusiastic. So I'll order the parts, and as soon as they arrive, I'll make another video documenting the repair work, reassembly, lubrication, measuring and adjusting, and the final calibration and tweaks. There are challenges with fine-tuning a specimen like this. It's designed for heavy duty, not agility or finesse. More bulldozer than Formula One car. But with a little patience and understanding, you can coax pretty good performance out of these beasts. Finally, I'll do some taste testing with several coffees and three different grind ranges, espresso, mocha pot, and V60, to see if the old burrs are still good enough. I predict that they will be, but there's only one way to find out. So, keep in touch. Cheers!